Hi, everyone. Ooh, it's loud. Welcome. I know some of you are still taking your seats or even finding parking, but we're going to get started. Um, it's great to see so many runners and readers and animal lovers at Winter Words. Um, I love when an author's work really connects with so many different groups in our community, and um, Chris McDougall's work definitely does that. Uh, I'm Carolyn Torrey. I'm the Associate Director at Aspen Words. We're a literary arts nonprofit and program of the Aspen Institute. Um, I have some brief announcements and thank yous before I introduce our guest of honor um, and also just remind you to silence your cell phones right now. Um, so announcements, with all this snow, it's hard to imagine that we're already planning ahead to summer, um, but we're coming up on the application deadline for Aspen Summer Words for our juried workshops. Um, our annual writers conference runs June 21st to 26th here in Aspen, and we have workshops in a variety of different genres. Um, the deadline to apply is February 27th, and you can find all that information on our website at aspenwords.org. Uh, ticket and pass sales only cover a portion of our costs for presenting the Winter Words series, and support from our members and partners um, is really critical to making this happen every year. Uh, if you do want to learn more about membership um, or how you can support Aspen Words, you can talk to any of our staff in the lobby outside after the talk. We also have Explore Booksellers on hand with copies of Chris McDougall's books, and he'll be there to sign them, so stick around after the event. And now I want to thank the sponsors who make the Winter Words season possible. Uh, so we have our season presenting sponsors, Beth and Josh Mondry and Helen and Wally Obermeyer. Our media partners are Aspen Sojourner and the Aspen Times. Our lodging sponsors are The Gantt, Frias Properties, Aspen Alps, and Aspen Square. Thank you to our grantors at the City of Aspen, Les Dames d'Aspen, and the Thrift Shop of Aspen. And thanks to Aspen Snowmass, Four Mountain Sports, and the Zberian Rug Company. Um, let's give a round of applause for all of our season sponsors. And now it's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Christopher McDougall. So when Chris was a sophomore in college, he sent a handwritten letter to Hunter S. Thompson, one of his journalism heroes, via the Woody Creek Post Office. Hunter didn't write back, but Chris still went on to become a celebrated journalist and author, and now he's here about to speak in front of a sold-out Aspen audience. Um, in our town of endurance sports fanatics, Chris is well known for his bestseller, Born to Run, which explores the sport of ultra running and sparked a barefoot running movement, of which I'm sure there are many followers in this audience. Uh, before that, he covered wars in Rwanda and Angola as a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press. His latest book is Running with Sherman, which follows his journey to train a rescue donkey to compete in one of the most challenging races in America, the World Borough Racing Championships, which takes place not far from us here in Colorado. He lives with his wife, two daughters, and a farmyard menagerie in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Before he comes up on stage, we're gonna show a brief video to introduce you to his latest book, Running with Sherman. So please draw your attention up here, thanks. The first time I saw Sherman, he was sick and too lame to walk. A hoarder had him locked in a stall so small he could barely turn around. By the time we got Sherman out of there, his hooves were deformed and his spirit was crushed. I was sure he was done for. But we took him home and did what we could. Our friends and Amish neighbors nursed his body, but they warned us we had to heal his heart. Every creature needs a purpose, some reason to live, they told us. Luckily, we found something better than a purpose, a family. We adopted two more donkeys to join Sherman. And in the process, we discovered something pretty amazing. When Sherman has friends, he's a pretty good runner. That's when we got an idea. Could Sherman actually hold his own in a race against the toughest, fastest donkeys in the country? It was a long shot, that's for sure. But Sherman had fought the odds, and he deserved a chance to find out.
Isn't that a cool video? That's actually my cell phone ringing right now. Can you hear that? It's a Donkey Bray ringtone. That's the only cell phone that's allowed to be turned on. <laughs> hey, I have a question. Um, is Riley here? I need to see a hand from a woman named Riley. She's supposed to be here. Riley, are you here? Okay, okay. Um, if anybody spots Riley when she comes in, I need to know this immediately. The reason why is she's dating a good friend of mine from Philadelphia named Max Potter. And I've been waiting about 15 years to pay Max back. The first time I ever had a book published, I was on book tour. Like, your publisher doesn't tell, are you Riley? Is it? Is that Riley? Okay. This entire theater is on red alert for, for Riley. Um, yeah, so my, my first book came out, and, you know, your publisher doesn't tell you what to do. They just give you your book, and they arrange these events you're going to do in bookstores. And you show up, and you're, like, staring at lights, and you have a microphone. So you do the same thing everybody else does, which is you talk a little bit, and then you open the book, and you read out of the book, and you talk some more, and you take some questions. And so afterwards, you know, your friends and your family come up, and they're patting you on the back and telling you how great you are, except for Max Potter, who's like, dude, you started off pretty good. Then you just bored the shit out of everybody. <laughs> It's so like, what the fuck would reading out of the book do? Is this like history class? <laughs> this is Philadelphia, remember? So you know, I should have seen this coming. And I was like so like shocked and appalled. And then I thought, no, he's, he's kind of got a point. And that was it. Like from that day on, I never, ever, you're not going to see me go anywhere near that podium ever since. That doesn't mean I still got a little bit of a hard feeling for Max Potter. So I got, I got some traps laid for when Riley shows up. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's Instagramming her right now saying, Riley, turn around. <laughs> so the theme of our talk tonight is, is hope, right? H-O-P-E, hope. But for me, you know, hope is actually spelled A-D-H-D. And that really became apparent to me a couple years ago. I was invited to speak at a conference at Harvard University on evolutionary biology and human performance. And right before... I'm going to go on stage. I'm chatting with a guy backstage, and uh, his name is Dr. John Rady. He's a psychiatrist, a specialist in childhood development. And literally, like, seconds before we're going to go on stage, he's, like, patting me on the back saying, you know, I'm sure school is probably a real challenge for you, you know, of course, with your attention def deficiency disorder. I'm like, dude, I'm not ADHD. And he gives me this look like, oh, oh yeah, you are. <laughs> He goes, I, I've watched you come through this door. You're sweating. You almost knocked over the president of Harvard. You didn't excuse yourself. You grabbed the bagel. You met five people. You don't know any of their names. And you've only been here for seven minutes. And again, like, just like the Max Potter thing. At first, I'm like indignant. And then it was like that sixth sense moment where Bruce Willis goes, oh, my God, you know. Suddenly, my entire life makes perfect sense. Like, everything I'd done until that moment suddenly had, like, a rhyme and a reason, but in kind of a good way. Like, the ADHD had paid off. You know, it, it, really, the starting point was when I finished college, I didn't know what to do. I'd been an English major, so I got a job as a high school English teacher, never really processing the fact that a guy who barely made it through school should not, like, volunteer, voluntarily show up to return to school. I was a really crappy teacher, uh, called in sick a lot, never prepared, never graded tests. <laughs> and so at the end of that year, I thought I better do a radical turn and find something else. So the cool thing about teaching is, even if you're a shitty teacher, they keep paying you through the summer. <laughs> so I'm done in June, and I'm getting paid through till September. So I just took my money and went to Europe and just started like traveling around, just started backpacking around, bopping around. I got to Madrid, and for some reason, I kind of liked it. I uh, met a dude in a bar. He was a scene shifter at a theater. He got me a job. So I'm, like, shoving out scenery and carrying props around. It was great. And I stayed on for one year, two years. I started picking up some half-assed, under-the-table jobs, tutoring people uh, in English, teaching English. It was great. Except for one morning, one of my, like, little freelance English teaching gigs was at a bank. And every morning, me and this older British guy, this guy in his 50s, would show up at the bank at 7 o'clock in the morning, and we'd sit down, and we'd tutor these bank executives in English for about an hour. And I would make enough in that hour to, to like, 
sustain myself for the rest of the day. You work one hour, you play all day long. It's a great gig. Except I noticed that the guy I was working with, every day he would show up with this like brimming mug of coffee. And the entire time during the hour, he's sipping from his coffee mug, which is unusual because in Spain, most people don't have like the big, like, you know, big gulp of coffee. You go to the bar, you get a little cortado, a little espresso. That's what you have. I said, for this British guy. And after about two or three months, I realized that wasn't coffee in the mug. <laughs> this dude was like self-medicating with like a 16 ounces of brandy at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I had this moment of like, holy crap, don't be that dude. Like, don't wake up some morning, you're 55, what's happened to my life? I need to have a half a bottle of brandy to start my day. So um, I was desperate to try and find something else. I asked around, and a friend of a friend was a reporter in Madrid for the Associated Press. So I played that card. I met this guy. I said, hey, dude, is there any way you can get me an interview for a job? Now, at the time, I had less than zero qualifications. I had written like two movie reviews for a college newspaper <laughs> maybe 10 years earlier at this point. I, that was it. And maybe because this guy thought it would be kind of entertaining, he actually gets me an interv interview. Is this, are you Riley? Is this Riley? No? Okay, let's continue. Is Riley here? Hi, Riley. Where are you? Are you Riley? Oh, hey, Riley. You're friend of Max Potter, Riley? Oh, right on, cool. Let's find a good seat for Riley. Um, did you just get here? I'm actually feeling really bad about this already. <laughs> you didn't hear my Max Potter story before you came in, did you? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll keep it real gentle for you. Would you be my timekeeper? Okay. So Max is a good buddy of mine from Philly, and a lot of years ago, he told me something really rude, but it turned out to be really useful. And so in the spirit of Max Potter, if I start getting long-winded and I go beyond like 30 minutes, we just go like, okay, <laughs> cool. Riley's here. <laughs> uh, I brought a book for Colleen too, by the way. Cool. Okay, so, so this buddy of mine, Mike, gets me an interview for the Associated Press, and I show up there. I don't even have the clippings with me. I can only talk about the clippings that I had written 10 years ago. The Associated Press is the world's number one news gathering operation. This is a prestige position. And at the top of the pyramid of the Associated Press are the foreign correspondents. It's like I'm walking in this Madrid office, basically applying to be like Secretary of State. <laughs> no qualifications whatsoever. And I'm across the desk from Susan Linnae, one of the legends of the AP. This is a battle-hardened news reporter who's like covered revolutions and like earthquakes and like coup d'etats all over the world. This woman is top of the game. And she sniffs out my bullshit in like four seconds. I'm trying to like lie my way into this job and she's just got the beady look in, in her eye and staring me down. I'm like sweating and lying and squirming. After 20 minutes, she just does the mercy kill. She just stands up and just puts out her hand. She's like, okay, I I've heard all I need to hear. That's fine. And I go, good, thank God, let's get this over with. She goes, we'll train you here for a week and then we're gonna have to get you over there. And I had two thoughts. Number one is, you're hiring me? And number two is, where's there? <laughs> She'd hired me to be not just a reporter in the Madrid Bureau, but to be the head of the Portuguese Bureau. So she was head of all Iberia, both Spain and Portugal. I didn't even know this shit walking into the office. She was looking for someone to take over the Portugal Bureau, which she supervised. So in a matter of 20 minutes, I got hired for a job I had no qualifications for in a country I'd never been to, speaking a language I didn't speak. But she did, she trained me up for a week, puts me on a train to Lisbon, and off I go to Lisbon. And I get to the Lisbon office, and I walk in, and then my second in command, because now I'm in charge of this office, goes, thank God you're here. Civil war just broke out in Angola. I'm like, damn. What, what do we care? <laughs> we cover Angola. 
Does anyone know why you would cover Angola? Oh, this is an educated crowd. You guys should apply for that job. Yeah, Angola was a former Portuguese colony, and so they covered Angola and Sub-Saharan Africa out of the Lisbon Bureau. But as this second-in-command, the part-timer, is explaining this to me, there's a big map of Africa behind her, and I'm literally scanning the map like, where is it, you know? Oh, is it alphabetical? Is it near, like, Algeria? <laughs> and uh, four days later, I am now on another plane, now heading down to Angola as the Associated Press's new war correspondent in Sub-Saharan Africa. There was a phrase in Spanish, it's having your huevos in your garganta. That's where my huevos were, thoroughly planted in my garganta. I'm heading into a country I literally could not find on a map to do a job I've never done before in a language I didn't speak. Luckily, there was a photographer who was assigned to work with me, a guy named Guillermo, and Guillermo is Portuguese, but he also spoke Spanish. I spoke Spanish and English. The Angolans spoke Portuguese. So we would go out in the field to interview uh, soldiers. And I would ask Guillermo a question in Spanish, which he would translate to Portuguese, ask the soldier. The soldier would reply in Portuguese. Guillermo would translate into Spanish, and I would then translate into English to do my report. Like This was the quality of the news reporting that was going on in Angola circa 1990. But you know, I hung in there and worked at the job. And over time, you know, it's one of these things, man, you're either gonna sink or swim. And it's, I think it's where the ADHD kicked in because for me, it was an advantage. Um, I liked being out there. I liked running around. I liked finding new stuff. I liked always being in a different place. I liked that little edge of adrenaline you get when you're not quite sure if you're gonna be able to pull off this basically bank heist of a job that I was trying to get away with every day. And over time, once the, the fear and the anxiety started to abate a little bit, I could actually lift my head and look around and observe what was going on. And I, I learned a lesson which, which stuck with me and I think informed every decision I've made ever since. You know, when you go into an African war zone, you approach it with the mentality of like, holy crap, I'm going into a battleground of seriously bloodthirsty people. And everyone's gonna be at each other's throat. This is a really dangerous place. And what you find when you get there is 99.9% .9 of the people just wanna like play cards and like have dinner and hang out with their friends. But it's that one-tenth of 1% 1 of the dudes, and it's always dudes that make life a misery for everybody else. It's those dudes in power that don't give a shit about anybody else, and they just twist the horns of everybody else that's just trying to go on with their lives. And this is what I found in Angola. I found myself surrounded by people that I'd shown up terrified of, and instead being literally cared for to the point where there was one opportunity when most of the country was under the control of government troops, and there was one city a city called Wambo up in the northeast, and it had been captured, uh, surrounded by rebel forces. So nobody could get in and out of this city. It was like the third largest city in the entire country. No one could get in and out of there for months. And then one day, uh, Doctors Without Borders got authorization from rebel troops to fly in on an aid mission, on a human humanitarian assessment. So I was able to get on the helicopter with Doctors Without Borders, fly over the, re fly over the rebel guns, and get into Wambo. So we had 24 hours to do the assessment, get back on the, uh, on the helicopter, and get back out of there. So I'm running around, I'm interviewing people, I'm checking things out, I'm checking the famine situation, I'm looking for disease, I'm checking out the landmine situation. And after 24 hours, I zing on back to the uh, airfield to get on the helicopter, which is gone. And I don't know, maybe I didn't set my watch right, or you know, I wasn't supposed to go on the helicopter in the first place, they're gone. There is no communication out of Wambo. There is no other flight out of Wambo. I am foobard in Wambo. <laughs> so I'm standing in the airfield. Literally, the sun's coming up. I'm standing there looking around like, now what? And some people walk up to me and go, hey, why aren't you on the helicopter? Like, Good question. What are you going to do now? I don't know. Where are you going to stay? I, I don't know. There's no hotels. There's no, you know, there's no place to stay. There's no restaurants. There's no food. This place has been cut off for months. So these people say, why don't you stay with us? 
They bring me back to their house. And for the next four days, until the World Health Organization sends a helicopter back to get me, uh, these people completely took, took care of me. They fed me. They sheltered me. They kept an eye out for me, for me to make sure I didn't get in trouble. If there was ever a city in the world where misplaced aggression was thoroughly justified, it's a city in Africa surrounded by rebel guns and this like, big idiot shows up from out of town. If you really wanted to tee off on somebody, I was the target. And instead, people went out of their way all the time to make sure that I was taken care of. You know, I found the same thing two years later when the genocide bro broke out in Rwanda. I was quickly deployed from Angola over to Rwanda. This is an even scarier situation because at least in Angola, you had UN peacekeepers on the ground monitoring things. In Rwanda, the peacekeepers had just been killed, and so things were uncertain. Like, we went in, we didn't know what we were getting into. And the previous reporter for the AP, uh, right before me, had to leave because her photographer had gotten shot through the legs, and she had to stop the wounds from bleeding out with her own hands when they medevaced him out. So going into the situation, again, feeling extremely nervous because I don't know what I'm walking into. And what I found was a similar situation. A lot of really horrible things taking place, and yet these little islands of unbelievable humanity and decency and care among strangers. After about six years of this kind of stuff, I kind of felt like I had enough. Uh, I wanted to get away from that sense of sadness constant sadness, and so I decided to go home. Unfortunately, home for me was Philadelphia, so it really wasn't much of an improvement. <laughs> but I got back there, you know, there's actually a footnote in Running with Sherman, which I actually took out because someone in the Midwest complained about it. Um, I had a footnote. I was trying to explain, my wife grew up in Hawaii, and I was trying to explain to her why everyone in Philadelphia just seems pissed off all the time, and I said, it's a different kind of city. Like in most cities, you know, like you have the, like the Denver Marathon, New York City Marathon, people hold up signs and say, like, you know, way to go. You're doing great. You're a hero. In Philadelphia, this is a God's gospel truth. Uh, God's gospel truth? Yeah, I guess it's worse. <laughs> gospel truth. In Philadelphia, at the finish line of Philadelphia Marathon, every year there's a guy that holds up a big cardboard sign and goes, run, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Mallory, I should ask, is there any kind of like PGR rating on the, am I okay? All right. I'm sure Dennis Lane's a lot worse than this. So that's Philadelphia. So we get to Philadelphia. Um, I, I meet my wife who's from Hawaii. She's much more used to the Aloha spirit. This is kind of not the, the urban warfare I was really had in mind for moving home. So we do a complete 180. We start looking for a new place to live. And what we found was a place called Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania. And it is exactly what you imagine a place called Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania would be like. It is surrounded by Amish farms. Literally, the traffic in front of my home is horse and buggies. Uh, it was a log cabin on a creek. No neighbors at all. Amish and Mennonite farmers in every direction. It was amazing. It was fantastic. And I had never grown up around any of this kind of stuff before, but I really started to dig it. Uh, my wife got a couple of sheep, and she began milking the sheep. We got some chickens and goats and cats. And in a matter of a few months, I went from a guy who'd always been surrounded by like 2 million people at a time to suddenly being like this aspiring, like Carhartt-wearing farmer out in the middle of nowhere. And things were kind of cool. You know, so years went by, and I, I started to become good friends with my Amish neighbors and learn about their lifestyle. And things had progressed, but at the same time, there was still a good amount of Philly in me, enough Philly in me, so that when my daughter was nine years old, and I said, hey, Sophie, what do you want for your birthday? She goes, a donkey. There was enough Philly in me to say, you're not getting any fucking donkey. <laughs> hey, donkey. But I called it a donkey. But anyway, uh, but I, I knew what she was thinking. I kind of respected her thinking because... I'd forgotten about this, but a year earlier, we were out on a hike in the woods, and we hear this little like noise, this kind of clattering behind us. And we turn around, and what we see is this woman in a saddle riding up the trail on this little donkey. 
I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. And she hops off of it, and we're all petting the donkey and like feeding it granola bars. And uh, yeah, it was kind of cool. It was cute. And then she gets on her donkey and rides off, and we forget about it. All of us, except for my nine-year-old daughter, Sophie. <laughs> so for a year, this is percolating and marinating in her brain. And I knew now what she was thinking. She's thinking to herself, you know what? This is kind of a kid-sized animal. School's only two miles away. Like, you know what? No more school bus for me. <laughs> Get me a donkey, ride to school. And that was literally, when I asked her, that's literally what she was thinking. She would ride a donkey to school, put it out, because there's a cornfield right behind the school, put it out in the cornfield, bell rings at 3 o'clock, hop on your donkey, ride home. <laughs> so it was kind of nuts, but I'm thinking, you know, why not? We got enough acreage around here. We got open space. Why not? So I start asking around to the neighbors. I say, does anybody know anybody who's got a donkey? And everyone's like, dude, no. We also don't have any llamas, you know? This is, this, is, this is Pennsylvania. There are no donkeys in Pennsylvania. But one neighbor says, you know what? Actually, I do know somebody, and it's kind of a bad situation. He's a guy in our church. He's kind of a hoarder, and we got to get this donkey away from him. So I said, great. You know, it sounds cool. You guys got a donkey you want to get rid of? I want a free donkey. Let's take a look. <laughs> Why not? So me and my two daughters, we hop in the truck, and we follow this neighbor over to the hoarder's house. And me and the girls are all excited. We're like, hey, it's called Skull Crusher. It's called Zorro. Yeah. We think about names. And then we get to the house. And when we pull up in front of the house, for the first time, we're like, like all the fun like drains out of the car. We see this house, and it's a seriously bad, disheveled, kind of like Adam's family kind of thing. And that was the good part. And then we go behind the house, and we see this barn. And suddenly, like, you know, you just feel your stomach drop. This barn, just from the outside, was sagging over, rotten, moldy, really bad looking. So we open up the door, and we walk inside. And we're with the hoarder, and he is so proud of all this. And uh, he, he brings us inside, and we walk inside, and there is so much mud and manure and rotten straw on the ground that the goats are actually standing up on bales of straw just to, like, get out of this, like, rotten quicksand. And it's dark in there and so damp and wet and miserable. It's like a dungeon. And I'm looking around, like, where's the donkey? And the hoarder's like, oh, there he is. Like, there's Shaggy. I'm like, I don't see anything. In the back, against the wall, there was like this gray lump. It looked like a, like a, like a bag of trash. I go, that's the donkey? And he's like, yeah. And he gets a handful of grain, and he holds it out. And this, this lump just kind of turns and just takes a step and then just stops and just sags there. And I'm looking at this thing thinking, oh, my God, this is, <laughs> this is, not, this is not my daughter's birthday present, you know? This is not what we want. But at the same time, I'm thinking, we're definitely taking him. He ain't staying here. So I turn to my, my friend Wes and go, all right, um, okay, all right, fair enough. We'll take it. But then the hoarder says, wait a minute, hold on a second. I got to make sure he's going to a good home. <laughs> and I just said, hey, Wes, man, you have to sort it out with this guy but it's not staying here. you got to have it at my house tomorrow, or we're going to come and get it tomorrow. There's no way. I mean, this is, this is criminal. So we leave, we go home, and lo and behold, man, Wes is the most honest, gentle guy in the world, and he pulled off this, like, feat of international diplomacy that if he doesn't get the Nobel, he should at least get, like, a cuddle or a hug or something. Wes doesn't lie, right? So he's up against a guy that does not want to let go of this donkey. So what's he going to do? He tells the guy, hey, let's just give him to Chris for two years. Chris can get him healthy and strong again. After two years, my favorite phrase in the world, we'll see what happens. That was enough to persuade the hoarder to give us the donkey. So next day, truck pulls up, hay wagon in the back, and there is the donkey. So now for the first time, I'm actually seeing it by daylight, and it's actually a lot worse than I realized. Um, no one had ever trimmed this donkey's hooves. So its hooves had grown out and curved up so much that it couldn't walk anymore. Uh, it, it was covered in like matted manure on its, in, on its fur. Its teeth were so bad, you could literally reach in its mouth and just pull out a tooth out of its mouth. But, but the worst thing was, 
the look in its eye was just was just dead. It was just gray eyes, you know, no spirit there, no life there at all. And he was just standing there. So Wes and I got him off the wagon, and now he's standing outside in beautiful sunlight. He's surrounded by green grass, and he doesn't make a move. He just stands there like he's dying. And I think maybe he is. And I don't know what to do. So I'm thinking, man, this is the worst ninth birthday of all time. So I need some help. And so I think, oh, you know something? That woman, that woman in the woods, I got to find her. Luckily, in Lancaster County, if you're a woman who rides around the woods on a donkey, everybody knows who you are. <laughs> so I call around, hey, anybody know? Oh, yeah, you want Tanya. Here's her number. So I call this woman up, and she comes racing over with her husband, Scott. Now, Scott would later turn out to be a bit of a dick. <laughs> and Tanya would completely agree with me on this. But I'll tell you, man, if he came through this door right now, I would hug him like a long-lost brother because what he did next. Tanya and Scott show up, and they're looking at this donkey. And Scott is a farrier. He actually trims donkey's hooves as a hobby, which is kind of a weird hobby, but he does it for fun. And donkeys and horses and other equines. And so he looks down at these donkey's hooves, and he's like, I don't think there's actually anything we can do. These hooves are so far gone they're beyond trimming. Uh, I, and if we can't trim them, he can't walk. If he can't walk, he can't survive. Uh, donkeys and horses are very prone to colic. They need to move. They need to churn their legs in order to digest their food. If they can't move, then they will literally blow up from the inside out. It's a very painful death. Right, Jay? Painful, horrible death. Colic. Jay is an equine veterinarian. By the way, seek this man out afterwards. He has a charity for donkeys. So seek Jay out afterwards. Yeah. So Scott is looking at this donkey and he's like, I, I just don't, I think the only thing to do now, the reason why he's so gray in the eyes right now, he's probably dying in front of us. Uh, it might be better to just make him comfortable and put him down right now. And I'm just like, oh my God, my daughter's going to come home. The donkey's dead in the yard. <laughs> uh, the guy who thinks he's going to get it back in two years. <laughs> I got to talk to his ass. Um, and then Scott goes, I could try one thing. Do you have a hacksaw? All right, I got a hacksaw. This guy gets down there. And remember, this was not his problem. This was not how he was going to spend his Tuesday. This guy gets down on his hands and knees next to a donkey who could kick his face off if he wanted to. He takes a hacksaw and he starts grinding through one hoof after the other. If you've ever been down around a donkey's hoof, it is smelly, awful. It's a, not a nice place to be. This guy spent an hour and a half working on these hoofs. And he finally stands up, and he looks like the swamp thing. He's filthy. He's exhausted. He's sweaty. And he goes, this is the best I can hope for. It may work. It may not work. At that point, Tanya took over. And Tanya has been holding herself back because she is a raging ball of fury. She is hot. She loves animals, and she gets she-hulk mad when she sees this kind of mistreatment. So now Scott's out of the way. Tanya steps in and takes over. So she uh, injects him with some painkillers, some banamine, some antibiotics, and she starts shearing off, like, the rotten fur and, and the dung with these shears. But the whole time, she's just, like, veins out of her head, pissed off. And she can't vent the anger on anything except me. So at one point, she's taking these shears, and she clicks them off, and she's, like, waving them in my face. And she's like, you know what? You can't just stick him out in the field. You understand me? If he survives, you better find him a job. He needs something to do. You're going to have to find him a job. And I'm like, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, I'll find him a job, find him a job. Like, what, what am I, a fucking prospector? Like, what, I don't have a job for a donkey. But I'm just like, yeah, job. Just take the shears out of my face. But as, as she's doing this, in the back of my mind, I'm kind of like, you know what? There is one thing. There is one possibility. So about 10 years earlier, for a freelance assignment, I had been out here in Leadville for a pack bar race. I did a little article on it for, I don't know, Men's Health or Runner's World. And so I know I'm playing to the hometown crowd. Do you guys actually know what pack bar racing is? Wow, that was a thunderous okay. 
Well, I'll run you through a couple things for those in the crowd who don't know. So the, the mythology about pack borough racing was back in the 1800s when a prospector would be up in the hills, he'd strike gold, he'd throw all of his gear in the back of the donkey, and then he'd run to the nearest town as fast as he could to register the claim. So now you got a wild west town in the middle of nowhere. You got prospectors with, you know, gold in their pockets, donkeys outside, nothing to do. So these guys start to race each other back and forth. And so they started doing these runs and these races, and it became a tradition. So that even when mining went under the underground, they still used donkeys to haul the ore out because donkeys are small. They don't get startled by loud blasts. So um, you saw the donkeys around, and so the miners continued this tradition of running with the burrows. Continued it to the point where, well, let me ask you a question. Does anybody know what the oldest marathon in America is? Boston? Boston's a pretty good guess, because 1900s to 100 and so years ever since. That is true if you happen to be a dude. But for the rest of Americans who don't have testicles, you are not allowed to run that race until 1973. So even though the race began in 1902, for the next 71 years, they wouldn't let women run. Except in... Leadville, when they started the World Championship Pack Borough Race in 1951, even though it was 29 miles at 11,000 feet with donkeys, women were allowed to run from the beginning. So even though there were dudes in Boston afraid that the women would hurt themselves if they ran 26 miles with little orange slices and cups of water, <laughs> out in Leadville, they didn't give a shit. Like, you want to run with a donkey? Be my guest. <laughs> Have at it, girls. <laughs> and what happened was... You know, there's this whole thing, too, where I, I look at it a lot in Born to Run. You know, as distances get longer, you see the differences between men and women start to diminish. Not just men and women, but old people and young people as well. So, you know, you, you get in the sprint distances and the mile, things that play to normal male attributes like, upper, like bulk and testosterone, men do pretty well. But when you get into the activities that humans, the human animal, naturally evolved to do, the endurance and stamina events, what you see is men and women, old and young, tend to perform on a relatively close scale. And what you see is now in pack bar racing, which has now been around for over 70 years, we have got a lot of data to track. And what you find is since women have been involved in this activity since the beginning, there is no learning curve. They know as much about it as the men do. And what you find is, in a pack borough race, it's a coin toss, whether it's going to be a man or a woman who wins, whether the person is going to be in their 20s or in their 50s. What's really cool about this event is, you know, we tend to glorify the sports that dudes invented for other dudes. You know, football, baseball, you know, hitting things, hitting things. But, you know... Compared to other animals, we're not really good at hitting things, you know? Gorillas are way better than we are. You know, elephants are way better than we are hitting things. Things involving strength and speed. But when you get to the, the male attributes, the things that the human animal actually excel at, which are adaptability, um, partnership, and stamina, which is exactly what pack bar racing is all about, that's where humans excel, and all humans excel almost equally. So again, I'm... I'm Pretty in fire, on fire with this idea. I love the notion of pack borough racing. But now take me back to Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania, with a woman waving shears in my face, threatening me, I better find a, do a job for this donkey. And even though I love pack borough racing in theory, in practice, it kind of sucks. <laughs> You're taking the most stubborn creature on planet Earth <laughs> into a race, and it doesn't know that it's, it's actually in a race. You're taking this thing into a street with 50 or 60 other donkeys and firing off a shotgun and then running off into the mountains for 15 or 29 miles. So here I am standing here with this donkey, this idea that I need to give it a purpose, I need to give it a reason to live, I need to give it something that will make it move. Because at this point, even though the hose have been trimmed, it's been injected with antibiotics, it's still just standing there. It needs something to animate it, something to get it excited about this prospect of moving its legs for the first time in eight years. And I think, you know, one thing I know about myself is that if there's something I don't want to do, at some point I'm just not going to do it, you know? If, it, if you tell me 
that I got to stop eating ice cream and I'll live 20 more years. I'll swear to God I'm not going to eat any more ice cream and I'll just I'll do it in two days. I'll be eating. With the donkey, I knew that if this job that I was going to give it was a chore, I might feel compassionate and motivated, but after two weeks, I would, I would probably quit. So I needed to find a job for this donkey that was something that I wanted to do as well. And luckily, you know, years earlier, I had that adventure which led to Born to Run. I had a freelance assignment to actually not research running. I was down in Chihuahua, Mexico to do an article for the New York Times Magazine about a Mexican pop star named Gloria Trevi who was secretly running her own teenage brainwashing sex cult. True story. And you would think that that would be absorbing enough, right? <laughs> but while I was down in Chihuahua, I kept seeing pictures of uh, men and women in these long skirts and sandals. And I was reading articles about you know, this, this tribe, the Tarahumara, who were running 200, 300 miles in homemade sandals and winning races in Colorado. And I became kind of ADHD that direction. Like, you know, Mexican pop stars with sex cults come and go. But how often, <laughs> how often do you have a tribe of barefoot sandal dudes? So I, I began getting involved in that adventure, and that led to Born to Run. But the cool thing about it for me was, at the time I heard about the Tarahumata, I was not a runner myself at all, you know? I wasn't quite as bad as, as the donkey was, but I wasn't far off. I was about 50 pounds heavier than I am now. I was a broken down ex-runner, didn't want to try it again. I was always getting injured. And it was that adventure which taught me that you know, running can be fun, it can be joyful. You can run long distances and not get hurt. It doesn't need to be this like punishment for pizza, this, you know, this, this exercise in misery that we've turned it into. It can actually be a really kind of fun thing. That, like, running can be like, like a kid's recess. I had that experience with Born to Run. It had made me a runner. It made me look forward to running every day as like my personal recess. So now I'm faced with this donkey. It needs a job. I know about burrow racing. And I realize, you know what? Running is what gets me out the door every day. I really enjoy it. It makes me feel good about a lot of things. Maybe the same thing can be true for this donkey. Maybe I can make him my running partner. And we can actually jog together every day and run up and down the streets. Yeah, this is how fast my mind is. This is ADHD at work, man. And uh, so I say this to Tanya. I say, this is going to sound crazy. You say a job, right? Um, how about making my running partner? And Tanya's like, all right, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. But I'm going to tell you two things right now. If you're going to try and train the donkey, two things you have to remember. Number one, anything you want a donkey to do, you got to make him think he thought of it first. <laughs> and number two, anything you start with a donkey, you got to finish. Donkeys are instinctively the most self-preserving defensive creatures on earth. That's why they have a reputation for stubbornness. If you try to get them to do something and they don't want to do it and you give up first, that reinforces the notion in their mind that it was a bad idea to begin with and now they're never going to do it. <laughs> so she goes, if you want to start this experiment, we start right now today. So she gets a rope and some horse treats and she brings this donkey out to the road. And the donkey actually starts to walk, walks across the grass, takes a couple steps. I'm like, it's, it's working. He's moving. This is great. And then he gets as far as the asphalt, and he just freezes up and stops and locks down. He's not going to touch this asphalt. And Tanya goes, okay, number two, if you start it, you got to finish it. We got to get him to step on this asphalt. So Tanya takes this rope, and she feeds it about 10 feet, and she puts it under her butt, and then she leans back on that rope, pulling on the donkey. She looks like, 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 a, like a marlin fisherman or something. She's hauling back on this rope. And the donkey's looking at her like, dude, I'm a donkey. This is what we do, man. You're not pulling me anywhere. This thing just locks down. gets in that donkey squat. Tanya's pulling back, and there's like beads of sweat coming down her face. And I'm looking at the world's most stubborn creature, and Sherman, <laughs> locked in this tug of war. 
Tanya just sits on that rope, sits on that rope, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour, she's sitting on this rope, white knuckle on this rope. I could have gone inside and had like a grilled cheese sandwich. She's still sitting there. Tractors are coming by. They're like swerving around her. Tanya's not budging. 45 minutes, this donkey puts a foot down on the pavement and then another one and then walks out. And Tanya goes, we did it, okay? Always end on a good note. He did it. She brings him back inside, and then she's like, okay, from here on in, it's all yours. <laughs> so I was kind of intrigued by this point. I'd seen it in action, but I got this glimmer. Like I, when I saw Sherman actually fighting back, that's when the moment I thought, you know what, maybe there's something for, alive inside here, you know? If he'd been dead inside, he would have just followed her. But the fact that there was that little glimmer of feistiness, you know, of, of resistance, thought, okay, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity here. Um, it took me about three or four months before we had a breakthrough because we weren't getting much further than down onto the asphalt. Every day I would take him down, I'd pull, he'd resist. And then one day we got a phone call from a neighbor whose son, Zeke, is this terrific kid, handsome as hell, super smart, charismatic, kind, generous, just perfect in every way. And he just had a really, really bad incident happen to him, which threatened his life. And he was home from school, from college. And his mom had called to see if he could come and go running with us. Uh, his depression had become so serious that they were exploring everything they possibly could, medication and therapy, but exercise. You know, there, there's been a correlation between exercise and alleviating the, the depths of depression. So our friend Andrea called to, hey, listen, Zeke's home. He's struggling with this. Um, can he go running with you? And I said, sure. Did I tell you what kind of running we're doing these days? <laughs> Is he okay running with a donkey? And she's like, I don't give a shit, whatever. <laughs> so we ended up getting another donkey and a third donkey. And then my poor wife, who never expected me in Peach Bottom at all, let alone, she's from Hawaii. She thought she'd be in Pennsylvania for one year. 20 years later, I'm handing her a rope with her donkey. You say, hey, I got one for you too. <laughs> but this became the story of running with Sherman. Uh, we spent the next year, all of us working together, kind of solving our own problems, my own Lack of attention to detail and impatience and, you know, ADHD. Um, Zeke is struggling with, with his serious life-threatening problems. And this one donkey, Sherman, that we are trying to bring back from his isolation in the darkness for eight years to see if we could sort of revive him and give him a new life. And where it left me was, I think, with a profound truth that I don't think I would have gotten by any other means. You know, when you are trying to communicate with a creature that is nonverbal, you, you learn a lesson that I think we forget about all too often in life, which is there are times when you just got to shut up and look and pay attention and just look. And that was the only thing that started to make sense with Sherman. If I ever tried to force him, push him, no dice. If I just slowed down, watched paid attention and noticed, then you, you would see certain things. And bit by bit, this started to work. And it got to the point where we all started to grow as a group and form together as a team. And by the end of that year, against all odds, there was this moment in early July, we're leading three donkeys into a trailer and heading off for fair play to take our chance at the World Championship Pack Bar Race. So it was a crazy ass year. Um, I don't wanna leave you in too much suspense. So what I wanna do is, we did a little home video this summer, so you can actually see how, Sh how Sherman is doing today. Um, and I want to point out one thing, too, which is that there's a song here that my nephew wrote, my nephew Andrew Marcini. He's a kid. He's kind of his own personal Sherman. This kid's, yeah, he's that kind of nephew. Um, but I gave him, he's the first one that ever read a manuscript before my editor. I sent it to Andrew. Hey, dude, read this book. He's a talented musician. Can you write me a song to accompany the book? And what he came out with, I think, is just is amazing and genius. So here's a little video uh, showing you how Sherman and the animals are doing today.
think it's one thing, but it's another. I know your name was trouble, you bring out the rain. But storms like you don't last forever. Cause I prepare to ride out the weather, you shatter my expectations. I was underestimated. The person right Good job, Sherman. So happy I was born You went one way, I went the other But somehow we still found each other Do you believe in time? Tilda, say hi! <laughs> Thank you. That was a lot of fun. That was Zeke uh, going across the creek with us. And uh, that was my wife posing like this and one of my daughters. So you saw the whole clan. So guys, thank you so much for your attention. Riley, thank you for your very, very generous timekeeping. <laughs> Give me all the, all the leash I could use. Uh, if you guys want to ask some questions or anything, don't feel pressured to. But if you want to go dark, man, go for some secrets. Go for it. Oh, thank you. I love that question. So the hoarder was calling him Shaggy, and my daughter immediately rebelled. Like, we need something more dignified. So we had just seen that movie, uh, Saving Mr. Banks, about um, Walt Disney and uh, whatever. Um... Right. So there's the songwriting Sherman Brothers, all like the upbeat songs. And my daughter said, hey, how about Sherman? It's perfect. So he's named after the Sherman Brothers. Only donkey in the world named after songwriting Disney twins. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, so the question is, would Sherman have made it without the help of Lawrence? Lawrence is this goat that, just like my nephew, is kind of a pain in the ass, but in a crunch, man, he came through gangbuster. So Lawrence, the first night we had Sherman home, this crazy old goat is always jumping the fence, and he's trying to climb on the school bus with the kids, and... That night, he walks over next to, I always tear up whenever I talk about Lawrence. He walks over next to Sherman, sniffs him, and lies down next to him and does not leave his side all night long. So no, to answer your question, if there were not uh, animals like Lawrence, I don't think he would have survived. I don't think he ever would have adjusted to, to life outside of the dungeon. Yeah. Yes? How fun did you say? I just had dinner with her last night. <laughs> so Tanya, when you read this book, man, Tanya is a trip, and she never stops delivering. Like, you got to read a book to learn about Tanya. Um, so we had dinner with her last night. I go, hey, Tanya, what have you been up to? Oh, I found a new church. I love it. I think I'm going to be a minister. She goes to a black Baptist church <laughs> and is training to be a minister of the black Baptist church. Tanya herself is not Baptist nor black. Uh, <laughs> She has this great job. She works for a veterinarian who has his own hobby farm. She's taking care of a zebra, a water buffalo, llamas. So in many regards, this woman has had the worst streak of bad luck in creation. Um, but I think she's on an upward swing. So thank you for asking. She's, she's great. I'll tell her someone was asking about her. Also, I saw Zeke last week. I got, if you ever check me out on Instagram, I got a little video of me and Zeke together. Uh, Again, fingers crossed, man, this dude is just soaring. So we were on book tour together. He was like my, my road warrior wingman for like two months of book tour. And we were traveling around. And it's so great to travel around with like a teenage scientist because like they can find, like if we're in like North Carolina, I'm like, 
I'm feeling Huevos Rancheros today, Zeke. He'll find Huevos Rancheros within like six minutes of I-95. And uh, so, yeah, so he's, he's doing really well. He's applying to graduate schools. He's got into like Yale, Cornell, Berkeley. Um, he's still kind of a dork. Uh, I'm working on that aspect of him. <laughs> We'd be on tour at events, and he's a really handsome dude, really charming and kind of bashful. And then women would come up to him, and they're kind of like hair flipping and talking to him. And I'm like, Zeke. <laughs> and he's explaining like nanotechnology to them. So <laughs> anyway, uh, he's doing really well. We went for a trail run recently, and uh, I think he's doing really well. Um, it's good to be with him. Any other questions? It's way in the back there. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll mess up your flow. I'll get her, then, and I'll stop right. meddling. Yes. Here you go. I'll bring you the mic so you can be heard. How did a hoarder even get a donkey in the first place? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, donkeys are normal for you guys, but they serve no purpose in Pennsylvania at all. And the reason why it was hard even for our neighbor Wes to get that donkey out of his hands is because nobody wants a donkey. Like, they serve no purpose on a working farm at all in Pennsylvania. Uh, what I'd heard from Wes was there was some petting zoo out in Hershey, Pennsylvania, around like the Hershey um, fairground area. And Wes believes that this guy somehow got that donkey from the petting zoo, in, uh, petting zoo out in Hershey somewhere. But it's kind of a mystery. It's, again, it's like a weird exotic animal showing up in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Is Tanya still with Rick? Uh, Scott. Nah, that's when he turned out to be a big old douche. Um, I should stop beating up on him. I'm way more loyal to Tanya. He's probably perfectly a nice guy. Nah, uh, they split up. He kind of broke her heart and moved on. So she's not done well in the romance department. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And there was a moment when I was working up in the field... And, you know, the funny thing about donkeys is, Jay, you'll appreciate this. Whenever donkeys are startled, like the ears go, whoop, you know, the ears fly up. So I'm working up in the field, and I look down, and all the donkeys are looking at the driveway, and the ears are like, whoop. Like, what, what are they looking at? And I come down, and who's coming up the driveway but the hoarder? And I'm like, yeah, yeah it's been about two years, hasn't it? <laughs> I'm like, well, this is not going to end well. So I'm walking down there in full South Philly mode, like, this guy's going home with a new hole in the back of his body. <laughs> and uh, actually, and this is where, you know, it's the problem with mental illness. It's so easy to tee off on people that have a wiring problem. And what you forget is they just don't see what we see. He loved this animal. He thought he was, he was proud of his, his little dungeon of horrors back there. Um, and he basically, basically he came over to say goodbye. Uh, he had talked to Wes. Wes had told him, Donkey, you staying with me. But that moment where he came up, and then Sherman wasn't going anywhere near him. Sherman kept his distance. I know. Um, but I, I felt that, that, that pang of understanding, like, oh, he's not a bad guy. He just did not understand what was happening here. So, uh, yeah, he, he is coming on, and, and Sherman's still with us. Yeah. Or maybe, like, three more. Real quick one. <laughs> Rapid fire. <laughs> Elimination round, yeah. Will you do the race again? I was about to say hell no. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind the race. The drive was brutal. 3,500 miles with three donkeys. So they're running. We still run with them all the time, have a lot of fun. I'm not a big fan of racing in general. It always seems like a lot of fuss for the thing you do at home anyway. So maybe not the race, but we'll keep running with them all the time. And you had a question? Okay, cool. Easy. Yeah. Can you stay in touch with Scott Jurek and the cast of Border Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a lot. Uh, matter of fact, I just got a text from Jenny Jurek, Scott's wife. Uh, I'm going to see them. Uh, uh, Louis Escobar started the, the Born and Run Ultra Festival in May. So, yeah, I, I feel like I've seen everybody. It's one, of those, it's one of those experiences where we all kind of felt like on the edge of, I don't know, death or tequila at all times. So, we really became kind of galvanized. So I, I hear from Scott quite a bit, and, and I stay in constant touch with his. Do you, know, do you know Scott and Jenny? 
yeah, super charming Jenny, so she's my, my main contact. Yeah. Do you guys mind if we just keep going? People seem, you know, is that right? Okay, yeah. Hi, um, I'm originally from the Asheville, North Carolina area, and I've spent time with Will Harlan. Yeah. And wondered when's the last time you and Will have hung out. I was just in Asheville, and I thought I was going to see him there. I was there in, like, October, um, but I, I didn't see him there. So last time I saw him was last time I was on book tour. So, uh, yeah, he's a great dude, and Asheville is super cool. Um, but I haven't seen him in a couple years now. Yeah, but great dude, though. Are you guys, like, running buddies? Docu documentary filmmaker in Asheville, Rod Murphy, was um, doing the film about Will running in yeah. the Copper Canyon. Yeah. I did some of the... El, El Chivo. Yeah. Great right. film. Yeah. So I did some of the steady cam filming of Will that's in that film. Yeah. If you can see this documentary called El Chivo, it's about a guy from Asheville who had a board and run experience itself. Will's a super cool dude. It's a great film. I really like that film. Yes, Jay. Well, Sherman and I, you know, we have a kind of a tortured relationship. Uh, once Sherman, like, got his independence back, he, he, I feel like eight years of a captivity, like, he's now getting it all out. So, like, one day, I hear car horns honking down the road. I'm like, what's going on? Like, I look out, it's like, holy shit, all of our animals are out in the road. And luckily, there's almost, we get, like, two cars a day. And one of the cars out there is honking the horn. Like, we get, like, 20 cents of sheep and goats and donkeys in the road. Like, what's going on? So I go down, we herd them all back, and, and I put the chain on the gate, and I go inside, and I look outside, and they're all back out again. Like, what the shit? <laughs> Sherman, and only Sherman, has learned that if he takes the chain in his teeth, and he, like, shakes his head, he can throw the chain off, and then bang the thing open with his head, and, like, lead this, like, POW escape <laughs> <laughs> out in the road. <laughs> so... And so uh, that's the thing. So uh, I think the thing about it, what, what I have learned um, from the donkeys, though, is that, you know, you're, you're dealing with a creature whose instinct is to shut down if it feels uncertain. And to me, it's like how many times in our relationships where you're just going like, you know, you're in an argument and you see your side and that side and you're, you're pushing, pushing. That never works for the donkey. If you don't back off and try and put yourself in their shoes, if you don't try and see things through their, their eyes, you'll never win. And so uh, I feel like I'm not the one to make this judgment about me because I'm sure my wife and daughters have a much different opinion. But I feel like I've learned, like, you got to take that beat, that breath, and put yourself in the other person's shoes or else you're never going to make any progress in, in any kind of relationship. Yes, only in the back. Um, you know what? It's funny. And I really like the question because... Usually, I sort of see the thing coming, like, oh, okay, you know, this could probably be a good book or a good story or something come out of it. This one was just plunked in my lap, and it was happening, and it's happening so fast, and I felt so underwater, like so out of my depth. Uh, I didn't know how to keep, keep this animal alive. And it was only when, I remember it distinctly because I had a dentist appointment, and right before I got there, my phone rang, and... It was an editor friend of mine at the New York Times. And because I was going to the dentist, I was like, oh, fine, I'm happy to talk to her and, like, postpone. So she, we just started chatting. And she's like, hey, what are you up to? Like, Actually, I haven't worked in a while. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with this donkey. And she's like, that's going to be a great book. I'm like, it's, it's not a book. I'm telling you, I don't think this thing's going to live. She's like, that's why it's going to be a great book. Like, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think looking back, she was very smart because, to me, the stories that are most interesting is when the writer – herself doesn't know what's going to happen next. And if they can convey that in the story, then, then it works. With Born to Run, it was the same thing. I didn't know what the hell was going on with the Copper Canyon race. And so I think that, that came across. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Not to school. Uh, there was a period where we have a bigger donkey named Flower, and so the girls would ride Flower a lot. Actually, Tanya, I think you saw a picture of her riding uh, Flower. Um, so they've ridden flower. No one's ever dared to put their leg across Sherman. I think that would be... <laughs> that's an ER visit waiting to happen. <laughs> uh, so, yes? You 
Yeah, so the question is whether ADHD is like my, my latent superpower. Um, <laughs> it's something I like to like sort of joke about um, because it has turned out well for me. And I, I've never actually been officially diagnosed other than being like sandbagged like five minutes before going on stage. Um, and so I, I don't want to be too lighthearted about it, but I've got a really good friend who's a stand-up comic, Liz Mealy, and she is acutely dyslexic. And she feels that her comedy all comes from the fact that she couldn't focus on a written word, so she became very performance and, and vocal and verbal. Um, so something I, I wrestle with, I feel like there is this kind of like channeling and compartmentalizing of people who behave differently are medicated or disciplined or, you know, shunned. And, you know, maybe, maybe you know, and there's a lot in Running With Sherman. Um, there's been tremendously strange results of children with autism and epilepsy working with donkeys and seeing tremendous benefits from that. So with my case, I think that I was lucky in that my inability to stand still and focus, I was able to, to find a job that let me do that. Um, but it's all half-assed and it's anecdotal. It's just me trying to sort out my own life. So anything I have to say is only personal and I'm not sure if it actually translates uh, too well. That was a shitty answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Do we have time for more? Okay. Oh, right on. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm actually working on a new book now. Um, it's called King of the Weekend Warriors. And what I'm looking at is I, I want to challenge this whole notion of competition. Uh, I, I, there's these two guys I know, good buddies. One is like super alpha dog, intense. And the other guy's Mr. Zen, Mr. Chill. And they're best buddies. And they, they have set nine different world records. And basically what I'm, I'm curious about is whether competition is more harmful than helpful. At the same time, we need that sort of goal to strive for. So hopefully it sounds, it reads better than it sounds right now. All right. We should probably wrap it up. So cool. I'll be outside, guys. Want to ask some more questions? Thanks a lot. Thank you.